Hello, everybody. As people join here, feel free to leave any questions or comments. Um, we have a short time with the senator tonight, but we hope to get to some of your questions later. I'm Jason Joyce, publisher of Isthmus. With me is Judy Davidoff, editor and president. We're thrilled you could join us for this conversation with Senator Tammy Baldwin, who has been a newsmaker in Madison for over three decades and has appeared in the pages of Isthmus many times. Before we get to our conversation, I'd like to point out that today is Giving Tuesday, or as we're calling it, Giving News Day. As a 501c3 nonprofit organization for about a year and a half, Isthmus Community Media is powered by our readers, and we invite you to join them by heading to isthmus.com slash support. Our guest tonight was elected to the Dane County Board of Supervisors in 1986, representing downtown Madison. She also served briefly on the Madison City Council. From 1993 to 1999, Senator Tammy Baldwin served in the Wisconsin State Assembly. She was elected to Congress in 1998, and in 2012, she became the first openly gay member of the U.S. Senate and the first woman to represent the state of Wisconsin in the Senate. Senator Tammy Baldwin, thank you so much for taking time to join us tonight. I'm thrilled to join you on a special, special day. <laughs> I'll turn it over to Judy at this point. Well, let's get right to that special day. The Senate just passed the Respect for Marriage Act. You are widely credited with being the champion of the bill for putting together the bipartisan coalition necessary for passage. It's through the Senate. It's expected to get through the House. Tell us how you put together this coalition. Um, what arguments have resonated with lawmakers, particularly Republicans? And also maybe if you can uh, share, you know, our own Senator Johnson has not been on board. Um, maybe give us some insight into um, why that is. Well, you may have to have him on as a guest. Okay. <laughs> more about that. But let's let's take a couple of steps back um, and, and um, consider why we're even considering a bill like the Respect for Marriage Act, because in 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court, in a case called Obergefell v. Hodges, determined that marriage equality was the law of the land. And what that did was in all the states where there were laws defining marriage as a union between a man and a woman or constitutional amendments, um, uh, like the one that passed in Wisconsin in 2006, um, and even at the federal level where the Defense of Marriage Act was the law of the land, the Obergefell decision made all of those state laws and that federal law moot. And, um, and that was great. And everybody was um, uh, feeling like we had le leapt forward in history, right? And, the rights. Yep. And, 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 and what's so important is that prior to that time, um, LGBT couples, and families struggled to be able to assure that they were protecting one another, uh, making sure that they had family insurance, that they had visitation rights in the event of an accident or severe illness, that um, uh, if there were children, that the custody and um, parentage was um, recognized by law and recognized by uh, those who needed to respect that. And it was very difficult prior to marriage equality. And that all changed. But this past summer, when the US Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, they based their, they said that that case was wrongly decided. And then there were all sorts of other cases that had been decided on similar constitutional and legal bases, like um, uh, the case uh, striking down bans on interracial marriage, or the Obergefell decision we were just talking about, or even things like access to contraception, or other forms of intimate uh, uh, conduct, uh, all of these were threatened because the same privacy and liberty arguments uh, that were used uh, to, uh, to uh, advance Roe versus Wade were used in these other cases. And so all of a sudden, we had a need 
to provide certainty to the millions of Americans who are in interracial marriages or same-sex marriages that their marriage would be respected regardless of what the U.S. Supreme Court does moving forward. And in fact, if, if the majority opinion weren't enough, one justice, Clarence Thomas, wrote in a concurring opinion that we should relitigate mm -hmm. um, the uh, uh, contraception, contraceptive access uh, uh, cases, the um, Lawrence case, the um, Obergefell case. He actually sort of issued a figurative invitation to litigators to yeah. present cases to allow the Supreme Court to reconsider and overturn. So there were literally millions of Americans who were scared, um, frightened that their marriages might not be recognized sometime in the future. And those you know, who have yet to, but maybe dream of marriage, um, might, that it might be foreclosed to them. And that's what made the Respect for Marriage Act necessary. And so as we introduced it and started um, talking to colleagues about advancing it, you know, the Senate has these weird rules that require 60 votes to <laughs> advance legislation rather than a simple majority. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we were working to find uh, particularly Republican members who believed that this was something we should do. In July, the House of Representatives put up their version of the Respect for Marriage Act, and it passed pretty solidly with a whole big handful of Republican votes. I think it was 47 now, oh, that's not even close to a majority of the Republicans in the House, but 47 is not nothing. Not and nothing. so I remember being on the Senate floor when I got that news and going over to some of my colleagues and saying, hey, did you see what the House just did? <laughs> and frankly, a bunch of Republicans from your state voted for this. And you have, you know, they'll, they'll have your back. And, and, and so the early group, of uh, Susan Collins and Tom Tillis and Rob Portman and I and Kirsten Cinema. That's when we got together and said, we could actually do this. And we have been spending <laughs> week upon week and months since then to get it over the finish line tonight. And, um, and then it goes back to the house. They have to adopt uh, the changes that we made. But I mm -hmm. think um, maybe by next week, uh, maybe the week after it'll be law. How did so those did it ever feel? Oh, did it ever feel like this was not going to be the time? To, I mean, before the House passed that, did were you just thinking, you know, this is not the political climate for passage, or we need to do this, not that? Yeah, I, I was undaunted, especially after uh, the June um, decision of the Supreme Court, and looking. Uh, at the clear ramifications of that uh, for so many lives. I mean, first of all, the decision itself set half of America back, uh, you know, at least 50 years and in a state like Wisconsin, 172 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's um, half mm -hmm. of America are second class citizens. And so the, to me, this was uh, a very, you know, this was a very real prospect that mm -hmm. uh, this Supreme Court could take further steps. Um, I do think that one of the initial reactions I got from several of my Republican colleagues, um, even ones who might be inclined to support um, marriage equality in the, in the, you know, now it's the law, let's not mess with it, but they didn't feel the sense of urgency that some of us did, and especially those who I represent who are in interracial marriages or in same-sex marriages, um, especially those who engaged in decades of activism and organizing to get up to the point where we began winning these rights and ultimately the Supreme Court case in Obergefell. You've been involved in certainly the uh, struggle for equal rights um, in the gay movement in Madison for decades now. Is there are there certain people that you think of uh, in moments like this? People that you remember from your youth or even the early stages of your political career? Well, you ask at such a poignant moment when we remember um, Dick Wagner, 
who was absolutely one of my uh, biggest political mentors. He was on the Dane County Board of Supervisors um, when I was elected to the Dane County Board in 1986. He had been on for several years prior to me and was um, rising in leadership on the board and ultimately became chair of the board. But he was an out proud gay man um, and one of the earliest in our nation to be uh, elected uh, running as an out gay man. Um, in fact, he probably is among the first dozen worldwide, if you can think about, which also says a lot about the progress made between, you know, 1980 and today, uh, mm -hmm. where some of the things that we were imagining back then, um, you know, how long would it take? And that we've achieved several, uh, well, incredibly important advances. But I think about um, his en encouragement uh, and also, you know, always uh, uh, saying, uh, you know, you may not win uh, this first, you know, you might introduce a, a, an ordinance amendment to the county book of ordinances. It might not pass the first time, but use it to educate and to uh, perfect the policy, and then it might pass. So he was very pragmatic in his advice, but also said, yes, you can be visionary and um, imagine um, what should be and work towards it. When we... Did you think of him? To, did think, you think yeah. of him today when it I passed? I did, and I've been thinking about him a lot. We lost him um, uh, in last December. Um, and just a few weeks back, I was um, uh, at the... Uh, at the, at the corner where um, Jennifer Street and Willie Street meet, uh, renaming Triangle Park, um, R. Richard Wagner Park, which is Dick Wagner. That's, so when you drive by and see that sign, that's, that's who that is. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, when you think about those years of, of working on the county board and um, it, well, when we cover the county board today, of course, it's a much different body. It's it's overwhelmingly controlled by liberals. That there's hardly any need to work with conservatives in that body if you want to get something done. It was a different situation mm -hmm. when you were on the county board, um, doing things like you were doing now, trying to to win over your conservative colleagues. Um, you know, really trying to build a coalition. Were there lessons you learned on the county board? For, for trying to build coalitions that you're still using today? What, what were some of those lessons? Yeah, so there's actually a really powerful example. Um, and, and the Dane County Board back then was pretty evenly split between conservatives and liberals. Um, we did not run on a partisan ticket, but you know, you vote after vote and you kind of figure out where people stand. But you also think about you're unburdened by that party uh, uh, label. So you, there's no nothing stopping you from reaching out. So I'll tell you during my first um, two years on the Dane County Board of uh, Supervisors, um, uh, our first cases of first individuals came to Wisconsin who had HIV AIDS. Now, we know that the um, AIDS epidemic began in the early 1980s, but it wasn't really until the mid-1980s where, in many cases, um, uh, mostly gay men were coming home, sadly, at that point, to die because there weren't treatments, there weren't cures. Um, uh, there's still not a cure, but there's powerful treatments these days. And we were, I feared, ill-prepared as a county, as a community, um, to uh, yet avoid some of the missteps we saw in so many other places across the country where um, the companion epidemic of fear and misunderstanding created, as, um, created lots of challenges for, um, for people who were already um, trying to maintain their health with HIV or AIDS. And I remember going up to Dick Wagner and saying, I think we should have... Um, a task force that scrutinizes all of our county policies that looks at, um, you know, we had a county nursing home that might not have 
um, accepted people with HIV AIDS had we not had a clear policy saying that they couldn't discriminate. Um, we, we had the opportunity to get things right. And I had, uh, while we're nonpartisan, I had a panel that joined me on an HIV AIDS task force that were uh, both from the conservative side of the board and the liberal side of the board. And we worked to put together a series of recommendations that I think really put us in a much better position than many other communities in Wisconsin and frankly, across the, the country. And um, what I realized in terms of breaking down those ideological barriers is that even back then, um, people were brought together by um, wanting to um, help others. We had conservative members who had gay children. We had um, uh, folks who uh, wanted our community to get it right. And that was just a powerful experience. And um, when we would have, uh, you know, we had several events where people would come and um, educate uh, and we would have such robust participation because people were thirsty for information and facts. And uh, boy, uh, we haven't learned all of those lessons I could say from the pandemic we've just had. Um, but but it would you know it was it was a I think a process that it helped avoid some of those um, uh, uh, epidemics of fear and misinformation. Want to talk a little bit about the midterm elections? Yes. <laughs> well, well, once again, got a purple state. We've uh, re-elected Tony Evers and re-elected Ron Johnson. Um, any thoughts just on the Senate race itself, um, given your uh, election and re-election? Um, this time, Mandela Barnes was not successful. Um, any thoughts on what might be different in um, how you ran the race or the um, circumstances, the, the years? Well, I, I look at the um, race for control of the Senate sort of nationally as well as locally in our state of Wisconsin. And, um, you know, it, it, the, these days we still have uh, the burden of uh, these vast sums of money in politics. Um, you know, these attack ads, et cetera. And in the end, uh, the, the um, uh, Mandela Barnes was outspent um, mm -hmm. by several million dollars. Now, I don't envy anybody in Washington, D.C. who's saying, okay, we have the last $10 million. <laughs> Do we send it to Mark Kelly in Arizona? Do we send it to, I'm not suggesting we send it to the individuals, but you know, right, to, right. To no, I, yes. So get out the vote effort. Right. Do we send it to Raphael Warnock in Georgia? Right. Do we send it to Catherine Cortez Masto in Nevada? Um, do we send it to Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire? Do we send it to John Fetterman in Pennsylvania? Or do we send it to Mandela Barnes in Wisconsin? I kind of feel like it was so close, yeah. so close that that might have made the difference. I, um, I, you know, it was, um, it, it was, and and I got to, I was honored to spend a lot of time in the final weeks with both uh, Governor Evers and Lieutenant Governor Barnes, um, and uh, I, you know, a couple more days, the momentum was yeah. with us. Now, writ large. Uh, it did seem to me that the overarching message of the midterm elections with regard to the Senate and many of the governor's races is that extremism was rejected. Mm -hmm. um, not to a single race, but generally, generally when you had election deniers, when you had conspiracy theorists, they by and large did not prevail. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's heartening. And, that was uh, not necessarily um, a given. <laughs> no. In fact, let's say what people presumed to be the given going into the midterm elections was that this was going to be election, an election that um, was going to uh, benefit the um, party out of power in the White House. 
And people thought that Republicans would sweep the House and maybe narrowly pick up the United States Senate. And despite uh, those headwinds, uh, Democrats not only retained the majority in the Senate with now a 50-49 split, but we have a runoff in one week from today in Georgia where we may well uh, bring our ranks up to a huge 51 to 49. <laughs> and, um, frankly, I can tell yeah. you it, that may sound like minuscule in terms no, of the difference, but let me say that one of the things we're pretty good in the Senate of reflecting the overall balance between Republicans and Democrats on the committees. And so when we're 50-50, every single one of our committees was 50-50. I mean, the equal number of Democrats and Republicans. And that means you can really get deadlocked in committee and not be able to vote legislation out or presidential nominees out. And we'll be able to probably have, um, you know, an extra Democrat uh, so that we have a majority, a slim majority, but mm -hmm. on most of the committees, if not all of them. Mm -hmm. Are there messages? Uh Abortion has has become, you know, the issue that people think uh, really helped Democrats in this election. You traveled the state, you know, and you, your colleagues were all over the country. Were there other messages that you thought people were really interested in hearing uh, this time around? From yeah, Democrats? well, I would say I would put um, abortion into that um, frame of voters rejecting extremism, and I kind of mentioned election denial and um, uh, conspiracy theories, but I should have added the issue of uh, the overturning of Roe versus Wade to that rejection of extremism. Um, again, not in every single race, but in so many races, that was a pivotal factor in the reelection of my Democratic colleagues in the Senate, despite really, really tough races. And I also think that when you look um, in Wisconsin and elsewhere about, you know, who were the new registrants to vote? And there was a significant advantage among women. Mm -hmm. who, uh, who were um, early voting in record numbers? Young people. Mm -hmm. um, it was, uh, I think, something that had a very significant impact. Um, and I think, much of that organizing was done in, in non-traditional ways, uh, influencers on social media and things that somebody like me doesn't necessarily see all the time because I'm not always glued to it. But I really do think that there was a big surge um, that uh, we need to really pay attention to. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I think that um, re the rejection of extremism, but including on the issue of abortion. And let me say, what, you know, be a little more specific on that. In Wisconsin, we have an abortion, criminal abortion ban that was enacted in 1849, a year after statehood. No women in the state assembly or state senate at the time that that was passed. And frankly, no women even voting uh, at that time. And um, it, that is extreme. And it is extreme when we see states like Wisconsin endeavoring to um, make uh, it, um, access uh, even more complicated in Wisconsin, where um, many um, now have to leave the state to access uh, the care that they need to save their lives, to maintain their health, to... Uh, it, there's efforts underfoot that if we had not uh, reelected Tony Evers could well pass that would have, you know, potentially criminalized uh, doctors in other states serving uh, Wisconsin women or uh, penalized uh, the, the patients themselves. So, you know, these are very real extreme positions that are out there uh, that voters rebelled against appropriately. Um, another issue where um, strong emotions um, and a fair amount of anger, um, you know, have, have taken over politics, you know, for many years now uh, has to do with gun control, um, issues of weapons. 
we, we just saw, you know, obviously a, a fatal shooting at a gay club in Colorado. Um, you know, first, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I know that, um, you, you know, it's sort of become cliche at this point for, you know, some people to offer their thoughts and prayers, other people to say, you know, we need to do something. But I think there's a lot of uh, anger on the part of voters to say, well, when is something going to be done? And is mm -hmm. there something that can be done in the Senate? More needs to be done, but I will applaud the passage of the Safer Communities Act um, this past year. Uh, another bipartisan effort, kind of like the effort that went into uh, putting together the Respect for Marriage Act, um, that, uh, that has some real, uh, real teeth. And it was the first significant uh, gun safety legislation to pass both houses and be signed into law in 30 years. Among the things that um, uh, it included is encouragement for states to pass red flag laws. And red flag laws um, uh, permit uh, folks to petition a court uh, to say that an individual is of a danger to themselves or others and should have, um, if they can prove that case to a court, should have their firearms removed. And I will say in the Colorado Springs case, um, fairly shortly after we learned of this tragedy, we learned that the same individual had been arrested before um, in a, a threat. And already the, um, the, the lawmakers and the governor in Colorado are talking about strengthening their red flag laws. So the tools are there uh, now uh, for uh, folks to do more at the state level, as well as there's, um, in my mind, so much more we can do at the federal level. You may also recall that the Safer Communities Act gives an additional layer of scrutiny for uh, individuals under the age of 21 who are trying to purchase assault weapons, including check-ins with um, local uh, authorities who might know if uh, perhaps this um, individual had uh, difficulties as a juvenile, but it, it doesn't show up on the criminal background check because of their previous juvenile status or current juvenile status. And so there are, these were important steps forward, not enough. Uh, now, Wisconsin, uh, we, um, we have a governor who's had to veto efforts by the state legislature to loosen safety, common sense safety laws. And um, that shouldn't be the case. We should be working together. <laughs> and this is something that the Senate showed we could do across party lines. Um, to create uh, to create the circumstances for safer communities. The assault uh, assault ban just it's um, it, it's just it's hard to imagine that we had one in place. I know yes. a son said that, and what is so different now? You know, politically, um, that makes it um, you know not not uh, politically viable to to enact it anymore. Um, yeah, well, again, I think it's a great, if, if you look and observe what issues back in the day were things that the parties worked on together across party, uh, the party aisle and are now um, viewed as sort of, uh, you know, this issue and that issue are uh, the difference between who a Republican is and who a Democrat is. And um, I think we need to take a step back and look at that set of issues that um, and frankly, I think that's one of the things we saw today was that um, we saw Republicans say, I don't know that we want to be the party that is the anti-gay party. Now, we see troubling uh, attacks on trans youth and trans mm -hmm. people. Um, but I think that there was uh, at least a pause to say, is this how we want our party to be remembered on a vote like the Respect for Marriage Act. We need to do the same uh, with regard to gun safety and gun laws um, and get back to a point where we can agree on a problem. Too many people are being killed and slaughtered um, and say, let's 
apply ourselves to addressing that. Mm -hmm. All right. We have a couple more minutes still. I know. All right. Did want to uh, ask you about um, your support of the F-35 fighter jets. It is something that's supported by people in Dane County, around the state, but also um, probably is your most unpopular um, position among some Madison constituents. Um, so if you could just tell us again, you know, why it is you've supported the um, jets. And we also know that there's some mitigation efforts that are going on. And if you can bring people up to date on what those are. Fabulous. Yes. So just for context, the, um, uh, the Air Force um, had a, let's call it a competition among various um, Air Force, uh, National Guard air bases around right. the country. And they had various criteria that they were looking at uh, to make a decision about where the next round would go. We know that a previous um, Air National Guard base uh, uh, got F-35s in Burlington, Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Wisconsin uh, and, and Truax it, it particularly entered that competition. And uh, I, I, again, I'm not using the right words, but on all the criteria they were looking at came out ahead uh, in comparison to all of the other uh, competing bases. And um, uh, I think, uh, first of all, that that's, uh, you know, that says a lot for the skill of the men and women who currently, or until recently, flew the F-16s and the mission um, and how well they carry it out. Um, I would also say that um, uh, the Truax base, uh, the um, 115th Fighter Wing, um, has a long and um, great history, but also employs hundreds upon hundreds of both civilians and guards members and um, full-time military personnel. Um, so, but the, the, the concerns are, uh, I take very seriously. And among them, uh, there were concerns raised about whether if the F-35s came to uh, the base, um, would they contribute to additional problems with PFAS contamination? Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, uh, because of the uh, because of the um, the upgrades they are doing at the airport, we're actually seeing some significant PFAS remediation happening. And I think we'll see a net lessening. Um, and frankly, the real culprit in my mind right now um, about uh, PFAS at airports is the fact that the um, Federal Aviation Administration um, still mandates that PFAS-laden firefighting foams be used. They will not allow the replacement of those permanently until they feel that there is as an effective um, alternative. I kind of think they need to be pushed a lot more on that because we are seeing uh, pretty effective alternatives, but that's another, that's for another day. But I do think we're seeing PFAS mitigation in preparation for um, the F-35s coming. But the other real uh, issue is um, noise. And noise was an issue prior to uh, the F-35s. It was an issue with the F-16s. It's also, the, the most noise complaints are based on commercial aircraft. Mm -hmm. And um, so, the, the neighborhoods, the highly populated neighborhoods um, are going to have an opportunity to uh, uh, bid for grants to upgrade their weatherization and their soundproofing. And um, it's not moving as fast as I would like to see, um, but I do hope that folks who are interested in um, not only you know, for noise and soundproofing purposes, but also weather uh, proofing purposes, this could be a real win-win. Um, and people could actually experience lower sound levels than before. Um, if, if this, uh, uh, you know, if and when um, we uh, move forward with this, but I will tell you, I fought very hard for those grant dollars to be part of our, um, our annual appropriations measures and um, expect that they will be allocated through affected neighborhoods. Okay, good. 
Well, we want to be respectful of time. So, um, and I know we started a little late, but so we, do we have any questions? I think we um, got to just about all the questions, actually. We we covered a lot of ground here in, a, in about yeah. a half an hour. Yeah, um, I had just a question about, um, you know, seeing how, it's how you split your time between Wisconsin and, and D.C., uh, what do you, like, when you're in D.C., what do you wish that you could get that you used to get in Madison? I mean, this could be something to eat. This could be something to drink. Like, what, what do you wish could just get transported to D.C.? Oh, goodness. Well, certainly cheese curds is chief <laughs> among the things that are very plentiful in my neighborhood at all the stores that I go to and hard, kind of scarce in Washington, D.C. Um, but, you know, I just love... Um, I love Wisconsin, and uh, I, when I'm on Capitol Hill, I'm kind of usually tightly contained on Capitol Hill, and when I'm home in Wisconsin, I um, not only enjoy my hometown of Madison, but get a chance to travel throughout uh, the whole state, and it's a gorgeous state, and, um, uh, and I love it and miss it while I'm here. Uh, I, I will say that um, my commuting patterns pretty much when I first got elected to the House and then the Senate was a back and forth every week. Uh, the pandemic kind of messed with that for a little while. And um, I'm glad to be pretty much getting back to a more regular routine uh, that, that I really missed um, when we were doing all of our work from home. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think others uh, are along with you on that ride. Actually, a, a slight yeah. return to normalcy is always good. Um, <laughs> we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, um, especially on this important day for you. And yeah. Congratulations, and uh, again, uh, happy holidays. And uh, thanks Thank for you. joining us. Yeah, thanks for uh, all thanks, your work. Thanks to all <laughs> of our you. readers for tuning in tonight. And again, on uh, Giving News Day, if you could throw a few bucks our way, Isthmus would sure appreciate it. Uh, Isthmus.com slash support. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye.